Right, hello and welcome everybody to Bristol Museum and Art Gallery um, to our um, Death Human Experience Related event, Death Professionals in Conversation. My name is Lisa Graves, I'm the co-curator of Death the Human Experience and Death Is It Your Right to Choose, um, the exhibition that opened upstairs um, last Saturday. Um, they're both on to the 13th of March, so if you haven't seen them, please do go and see them. Um, so I'm just going to start with a few points of information. Um, fire escapes, um, so back out the way you came in, um, or through the cafe behind us, or up the stairs, and you'd be shown the way out. Uh, toilets are behind you, the gentlemen on this side, ladies on that side. Um, oh, the bits of paper on your seats are pay-what-you-think envelopes, so if the event has been worthwhile and you want to give us a donation, that's great, and then you just put it in the box um, in the front hall on your way out. Um, oh, the other thing to say is that we are recording this evening and it will be put um, on a, a link to our blog site uh, next week sometime. So please, if you're going to ask uh, questions and you wish not to be recorded, then please don't ask any questions because it will go out um, to the public. Okay, so I'm just going to start with an introduction to our speakers tonight. Um, starting um, to your left... Um, is Rachel Prothero. She is the Senior Registrar of Burials, Cremations and Exhumations, part of Cardiff City Council Bereavement Services, where they run one crematorium and seven, chem seven, seven cemeteries in Cardiff. The range of services they offer include help with family history research through the burial registers, uh, guided heritage walks and memorial services, and advice on legal aspects of dealing with the deceased. Then we have John Pitchers, Mortuary and Coroner Support Manager at Flax Borton Public and Forensic Mortuary, part of Bristol City Council. Uh, John's work includes looking after the bodies of the people who are referred to the coroner and arranging viewings for the family, and as well as being an anatomical pathology technician who undertakes support work during post-mortems to try to resolve causes of death. Uh, and next to him is Karen Forbes, professorial teaching fellow at the University of Bristol and consultant in palliative medicine at University Hospitals Bristol NHS Trust. Uh, her work looks at providing quality end-of-life care in hospital settings, but also helping to train and educate students and junior doctors to better deal with death and dying. And last but not least is Sue Chard, the independent funeral celebrant, um, and she's based in Gloucestershire, and her website is called A Great Way to Go, which tells you something about her approach to creating individual and personal tributes for people at their funerals. Um, she also creates workshops to help people to better plan for and communicate their own wishes before they die. So that's quite a range of different um, professions and aspects of end of life and, and death um, services. But one thing they do have all in common is a desire to help demystify death and die and help us talk about it more. Uh, so hopefully we'll have a great conversation tonight um, with these guys. So what, how the format is going to run is um, we let them talk for five minutes each and then at the end of Sue's talk we'll take questions from the floor and then at, at that point um, the speakers have a few questions that they've sort of talked amongst themselves that they'd like to discuss so we'll hear them chatting about those and then open the floor up again to questions at that point and hopefully aiming to end about 7.30. So um, I'll let Rachel start the evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the photographs that we have here are all mine. Um, they're all from Cardiff, from, mainly from two of our sites in the city, the crematorium and a, a lovely Victorian cemetery in the Cattays area, which covers 112 acres. Um, I've had to write down the scope of my job because there's quite a lot involved and I will tend to forget things otherwise. So day to day I work in the office at the crematorium. Um, I'm the senior registrar there, so I look after the legal aspects of registering burials, cremations, and exhumations. That also involves advising the public about arranging funerals, about what happens after a funeral, and, of course, what happens during the day as well. We deal a lot with funeral directors day to day. We I look after budgets um, and day-to-day -day admin within the office and that sort of thing as well. We offer, in Cardiff a low-cost, fixed-price funeral service to try and help um, deal with funeral poverty, which is a, a real problem in this country now. The average funeral is about four to five thousand pounds, and which, especially if it's an unexpected cost, can be very difficult for people to deal with. 
especially when they're recently bereaved. So the Cardiff Council Funeral Service can usually mean that people can have a funeral for less than £2,000, so it can make a big difference to people being able to cope financially as well as in every other way when they're recently bereaved. We help people to arrange funerals without using a funeral director. So sometimes they're referred to as DIY funerals and we will help them uh, procure a coffin and guide them through the process, what they need to do to arrange the funeral themselves. We provide training to social services staff and to funeral directors. The reason we deal with social services is that we feel that they deal with people who will have questions about funerals and what happens at the crematorium and the cemeteries. Um, but they won't generally come to us. So if we can equip the people that are dealing with them at that time with the information, or even as long as they leave the train in knowing that we're there and they, they can tell people to contact us, then that's a really good start. We look after memorials, around 200,000 memorials in the city, um, as well as city statues and war memorials around, around Cardiff, the Welsh National War Memorial we look after. The, um, we have two Victorian chapels in the cemetery that I talked about earlier on. That uh, You'll see pictures of them coming up on the screen. They've been out of use for about 40 years, and they were pretty much derelict. We thought we were going to lose them, but we're in the throes of renovating the chapels now. They're such a beautiful building, and we already have two weddings booked for this year, and they'll be used for funeral services and for other events. We've got a lot of interest for theatre and music events to take place in the, in the chapels. This photograph now is one of our heritage trails. We take groups of public schools, smaller private groups around the cemetery. We tell them about who's buried there. We tell them about the cemetery itself, the history, its role in Cardiff's history. Um, the, the picture that you've got at the moment is a couple of drama students on one of our events where they actually dramatize either events in the life of the people who were buried there, um, eyewitness accounts sometimes, or they're the, they're the people, that the deceased themselves, which really brings to life the history that's contained in the cemetery. And there's been a very successful event, and that's in conjunction with um, the University of South Wales that's based in Cardiff. And as you heard, we help people with family history, which is hugely popular now. I blame the BBC. Um, and there's lots of people wanting to know who they think they are. And um, one really good way of doing that is finding where people are buried, because there's often people buried in family graves that they didn't know about, and it can open up whole new areas of, of research for them. So like I say, that's why I have to write it down. It's quite, quite a lot involved. Um, but I'll pass you on to John now. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm John. I'm the uh, coroner and support manager, uh, mortuary manager for uh, Flaxport and Public and Forensic Mortuary. Um, I'm an anatomical pathology technologist by trade, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but now I kind of have a dual role, so I split my time. I could be doing anything from budget forecasts to um, undertaking a complex reconstruction of someone who's, who's been in a nasty accident. So I'll leave it to you to decide which one's more interesting. Um, but yeah, I split my time between those two kind of areas now. Um, so we cover the area of Avon. Now Avon does not exist as a county anymore, but it does exist as a coroner's jurisdiction. Um, so I uh, report to the Avon coroner who covers the unitary authorities of Bristol, North Somerset, Bath, North East Somerset, and South Gloucestershire. Uh, so it's one of the biggest coroner's areas in the country with around about 5,000 deaths a year. Um, at the mortuary, we deal with approximately 1,600 examinations a year, so autopsies a year, um, and around about 100 forensic autopsies. So the services that we would uh, provide uh, routinely are autopsies on people from either the community or from hospitals who require a coroner's autopsy. So the reasons for that are many, but generally it's where the cause of death is unclear. So 
either the clinician who is attending them in hospital or the GP doesn't feel satisfied um, enough to issue a death certificate. Um, some people automatically get referred, so if you um, die in any kind of accident or unnatural death, then that automatically gets referred. Um, um, anybody who dies having not come around from anaesthetic, there's lots and lots of different rules, but if someone is referred to the coroner, um, a lot of the time that will result in an autopsy being performed in order to determine the cause of death. Um, so that makes up the bulk of our work. We also do a lot, um, an amount of forensic work on behalf of Avon, Somerset and Wiltshire. So anybody who has died in circumstances which could give rise to uh, a criminal prosecution um, will be dealt with by us. Um, we also deal with um, cases where the coroner has not been involved but the family have wished an examination to go ahead so they've given their consent for an examination to go ahead to perhaps clarify something um, about the death that they weren't sure about that were, but that was probably not related to the cause of death itself. Uh, we also deal with um, infectious cases so anybody who has a infection that can't necessarily be dealt with in a normal facility would come to us. Um, we also deal with um, cases of chemical contamination so anything out of the ordinary or anything that requires um, specialist expertise or equipment would come to us. Um, we are also responsible for planning for some of the um, hopefully never events that could happen which are um, mass fatalities or multiple deaths so um, either from accident or from um, crime then we are also involved in planning on a regional basis for that so we, we ensure we have plans in place um, and we also are obliged to respond nationally and internationally if there is an incident involving British nationals we can be called upon by the Home Office to actually go and deal with that. Um, so that's, that's the more technical side of the work. Um, we also have um, a large part of the job which is actually looking after bereaved people so we, we organise and conduct viewings and formal identifications with the bereaved. Um, we will support them through the process and answer any questions they have and, and, try, and try and make the experience a as positive as it possibly can be under the circumstances. Um, we also do a lot of training. We're involved with training other professionals also. Um, we lecture quite a lot to college students um, and we also, um, for our sins, are used quite a lot on television programs. Um, some of you may recognize us from Broadchurch and programs like that. Um, there's been quite a trend of uh, TV programs recently where there's been an element of, of mortuaries being involved and they usually come to us and as long as they are willing to portray it in an accurate and non-sensationalist way then we usually give consent for that so you may well see us again in future. Hello, so my name is Karen Forbes. I'm a consultant in palliative medicine. I'm based in the oncology centre which is down at University Hospitals Bristol. Um, I am 50% uh, clinical, 50% academic, so I spend half of my time on the wards seeing people with palliative care needs, and the other half um, involved at the university, mainly in education. So I'm the year five lead, which means that I um, organize the um, teaching for the fifth year medical students. So um, I thought probably the best way to describe what I do was do a sort of day in the life of, if that's all right. Um, so yesterday morning, I started off doing a journal club with my colleagues where we went through um, a recent paper around how best to manage a particular symptom in people who have life-limiting illness. And then I did clinic. Um, and in that clinic, I saw, in fact, three people. So one of the joys of doing palliative medicine is that it's recognized that I need time to see people. Um, so I saw somebody who had a very advanced pelvic tumor who is becoming more sick, has quite a lot of pain. So we, had, we talked about her pain, but we also talked about the future, and she wanted to talk about what would happen to her as she became more unwell and was less able to look after herself. Um, 
the second patient that I saw was actually a very young woman who has a life-threatening illness um, and was very ill about a year ago. She's well at the moment, but she wanted to talk about making a document called an advanced decision to refuse treatment. So she's very clear that it's likely that she would get to a point where doctors might think she should be ventilated um, because she's young um, and they would tend to treat rather than not treat. And she's very clear that she would not want to be ventilated and wants to make her wishes clear about what she would want should she not be able, um, because she was so sick, to tell people what she wanted. So we went over a draft of a document um, that would enable her wishes to be met if she was very sick. Um, and then I went from clinic to see, in fact, a 17-year-old girl with a very severe pneumonia who is not going to die. I very, very, very much hope. The reason I was seeing her was because she has very difficult pain secondary to her pneumonia. So I was seeing her because um, of my expertise in pain. So not all of the patients that I see are going to die in the near future. Some of them I'm seeing because they are very sick and have other symptoms. Um, but uh, I'm very hopeful that she will get well and go home. Um, and then in the afternoon, I was um, doing a finals exam with a fifth-year medical student um, where, again, we went to see a lady who has a very severe chest problem, but the student had to take a history from the patient and examine them to my um, satisfaction. She did. She was absolutely excellent, and um, so she passed that bit of her finals. It was just a small component. Um, so then I went back to, the, um, to our office and talked to the rest of the team. So I'm part of a multidisciplinary team made up of consultants, training doctors, and specialist nurses who had all been seeing patients throughout UH Bristol all day who had palliative care needs. Um, and we're very good at debriefing at the end of the day um, catching up so that the nurses can say, I saw this situation and I did this, are you happy with that? Um, would you have done anything different? Um, and normally, to be honest, making sure we're all all right, checking up on each other and probably having a bit of a giggle before we go home and start again the following day. Good evening, I'm Sue Chard and I'm an independent celebrant, which um, means nothing really. I, I made that up. Um, and, and what it means is that I'm not an ordained priest. I'm not a humanist because of my own personal journey. Um, and I haven't done the civil celebrant training. So I'm not going to continue telling you what I'm not. But um, when, it, when somebody suggested I did actually need a business card, I had to come up with a title because people need to know. So really, what I do is I meet families when they've gone to a funeral director and they've decided for many reasons that they don't want an ordained priest to do a funeral. Um, as an aside, I also, that work has led me to, um, to develop a workshop where I talk to people about how you emotionally plan a funeral, with a few practical things in as well, but how you sort out the emotions of it first, because if you can sort that out first, the practical things come much easier. And I also work with schools in Bristol um, memorial, on memorialising thinking about if they've lost a member of staff or they've lost a child, how, and in fact, if they want to take part in some memorialization for the school. So I guess my work is about helping people to consider how we remain in memory after we've died. And for the most part, 
that sees me in a crematorium setting, sometimes in the middle of a field, um, in a garage once, um, in hotels, in village halls, putting together a funeral rite. And I use that phrase um, because there's a move to talk about celebrations of life. Quite often we're quite fearful of the word funeral. But actually, even if what people request is a celebration of life, there does need to be a funeral moment, however short. There needs to be a moment of understanding that we are in a transition from being next to somebody physically to leaving a place and holding them safely in our hearts. And so to only celebrate the life can often leave people wanting in that right. So again, need a whole new dictionary, but, but funeral rites are what I create. And I hope that they're person-centered and I hope that they're about listening to what people want and then translating them on the day. Switch my mic back on. Uh, right, thank you very much, everybody. That was great. Um, so I guess we can start getting questions from everybody now. So hands up. Who'd like to go first? Anybody? Okay. Why do you think we're so scared of death in the Western culture? Um, I think we're scared of death in Western culture because increasingly we are able to control our lives. Um, we're used to switching the lights on and off. We're used to um, knowing what should happen in our lives. We go to school and then we try and get a job and we go to work every day. And, um, and when people are ill... They lose control, and the ultimate loss of, loss of control is not knowing what happens to you after you've died. So I think it's about um, people who, who are used to knowing what's going to happen, or at least having a very good idea about what's going to happen, having no idea what really is going to happen to them. That's my personal view. I, I'd like to say that I see a lot of people who are not. Mm afraid, an awful lot of people. Uh, something I didn't say is I also work with folk before they die, thinking about their funerals. Um, but I think for a lot of folk, the fear comes from wondering how we remain, that how much of our life narrative we've left behind, how much of a difference we've made, um, how we rectify things that we're not proud of, and that often if you sift it, it isn't about being frightened of the process, it's, it's about what we leave behind or don't leave behind. That's something I hear vocalised an awful lot. And there's the fantastic quote in the exhibition about life being pleasurable and death being peaceful. For some, I would take an issue, it isn't always. The, transi the transition is what's hard. And I think quite often it's that transition, isn't it, where the fear comes. I think well, those, those issues are compounded completely by the fact that we're just so terrible at talking about these things. Um, and certainly, trying to pretend that it's not going to happen and keeping it hidden, certainly um, coming from a hospital background. Um, in my previous role, I worked in a hospital in Bristol in, the same, in a similar position. Um, and it became clear quite quickly that even the staff didn't want to talk about our end of the site. Um, it was almost something to hide away. There was no signposting to the mortuary and the hospital. Um, a lot of the staff didn't know where we were. Um, and you can understand a reluctance to talk about that. The hospital is obviously a place of healing. Um, you don't want to get hung up on what happens when that can't be completed. But it also um, caused quite a lot of problems in terms of when staff did have to have conversations with people when somebody had died, 
it was made very, very difficult by the fact that they hadn't really thought about it and they had really ha didn't have much knowledge about, about where we were and what we did. Um, it would result in people getting lost on the way to come to the viewings and things like that. I had one nurse who confessed to me that she'd hid in a cupboard once rather than, rather than speak to somebody about what was going to happen in the mortuary because she simply didn't know what to say. And I think that's, that is kind of a good illustration of how we deal with it in the wider society as well. I think things are getting better, which is great to see this kind of thing and this kind of conversation. I think people have started to talk about it more. But I think for a long time it was something that you just didn't talk about. And that obviously adds to the mystery of the whole situation and that can increase the fear of the situation. From my perspective, um, looking at the heritage and history of cemeteries and death, it's modern Western culture that's, that doesn't want to talk about death and is scared of death. The Victorians celebrated it. They loved it. You know, you'd spend more on somebody's funeral than you would on them in their entire life. It was, funerals were paraded through the streets. But it, from my perspective, it seems to me that we've become more and more detached from the whole process um, because of medication, really, and because our health system is so fantastic because people used to die at home you'd have the dying person at home the family um, of whatever age those family members were would see that that person was dying they would know that that person was dying they'd see possibly the person die they'd see the dead body it would be kept in the house now all of those things happen in hospital you choose who you take to the hospital you choose who sees that person um, and then the funeral director comes and takes the body away and the body's in the funeral home. And it, we've just become that much more detached and we can switch off from it, so we choose to. Great answers, thank you. Great yeah. question. Um, any more questions? Yes. Um, you all have, um, you know, slightly different... Um, uh, your occupations kind of approach death slightly differently, whether from a medical, social, emotional, historical, legal point of view. I was just wondering, uh, what is it that motivated you to choose that particular kind of path or angle in that kind of approach to death? I'm not sure I chose it, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I was, I've been in the role, well, in the job in the place I work now for 18 years. I've been doing the job I do now for 13 years. Um, and I was just in my early 20s and looking for a job. It looked quite interesting, so I'm, I applied for the job. It wasn't a sort of, I went to work in the death industry. Um, I was working in the centre of town at the time, and that looked like a much greener, nicer place to work. A bit more peaceful. Um, and, it, and it is. And I've... I've been lucky, I've had good opportunities and I've moved around a few different roles and as, as I explained, the role I've got now is very varied so that keeps me interested. And um, I'm lucky and I get the opportunity to do lots of different things but yeah, I think it was more by accident, more by chance than uh, choice to be honest. But, but it's by choice that I've stayed, definitely. I think I would echo that to a certain degree. We tend to be quite wary of people that say, I've always wanted to do this ever since I was little. And you go, really? Um, okay. Uh, that's not a good thing to say in an interview. Just, um, <laughs> but no, it was similar. I was working in a hospital in a completely different role. Um, and I heard about this role um, through, through colleagues and friends of mine. And it just seemed, again, a very, very interesting um, part of the process to work within. Um, there was lots of opportunities to, to get involved in lots of different aspects of, 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 um, of, of the work from, like I say, from the chance to go abroad and deal with lots of different incidents and things like that, down to um, being involved in um, you know, hospital policy around last offices and things like that. So there was a lot of variation, and it's the actual... It's, the, it's, it's definitely the technical side of things which, which keeps things fresh. Um, there is an enormous variety um, 
in the ways in which somebody can die. Um, and that presents certain talent challenges, both for us and for those that are left behind. Um, and it's my role, really, to help give them both a technical answer, so for why somebody has died. Um, in the majority of cases, we can do that, not always. Um, but there's also the role in trying to support them through um, tasks which may well come more into the role of Sue there, which is when they actually come to see their loved one. Um, and it's, it's that balance between giving them enough technical information and giving them enough support to um, start them onto that journey to the transition which Sue was talking about and to actually make it a real event. Um, so that's really what, what's kept me interested in it. I, I just, it's very interesting, but it keeps you on your toes, I think it'd be fair to say. Um, I, I always wanted to do medicine, um, and then I, as a fifth year medical student, um, I did an attachment in cancer medicine, and I absolutely loved it. Um, so that was me, I was going into oncology, and I did all the exams and things I needed to, and I got into oncology, and I suddenly thought, oh my goodness, this is a bit different from what I was doing before. And I hadn't really twigged that the hospital I was working in as a student um, used to have radiotherapy treatment machines, but no longer had them, but, but retained the beds. So in fact, the patients who were in those beds were the ones who weren't having treatment. So what I was actually seeing was the palliative end of oncology, if you like. And the thing that had attracted me to it was the fact that um, it can be done very badly, that it requires good communication skills, and I really enjoyed talking to people and working out what was important to them and how we could make a difference. Um, and the fact that you can make a difference. You really can make a difference. Even though somebody is very ill, they may have been told that their life is short, they know they're approaching death. You can make a huge difference by looking after them, not just their pain and their symptoms, but by talking to them, talking about their wishes and, and talking about their emotional and psychosocial needs. Um, and, you know, I originally thought I was going to be an NHS consultant in palliative medicine, and then I realized I could make a difference to more people by teaching others to do this. So I am evangelical about teaching palliative care to the fifth years. Um, and um, they all sort of groan when I, when I start on them. But um, John is absolutely right. There are an awful lot of staff who find dealing with the fact that people are going to die in a healthcare institution or, or even in the community very difficult because if you actually ask budding young medical students why they wanted to do medicine, there are basically two reasons. One, of, one is I've always wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to make people better. And the other is I was really good at sciences at school and they told me I should probably do medicine. That second reason is more and more prevalent, and that really, really frightens me, actually. But most people go into the healthcare professions to make people better. And we don't make people better. We make lots of people better. Yes, we do. I mean, if you come in with, you know, the 17-year-old girl I was talking about, she is going to get better because of modern health science. But if you've got chronic respiratory disease or chronic liver disease or diabetes. We look after you, but we don't make the diabetes go away, and we don't make the chronic disease go away. Um, but then when, when people get very close to death, everybody stops talking about it. Um, and I realized that I wasn't frightened about talking about it, and that you could make a difference. And actually, it's an absolute privilege, the job I do. Because most of the time, when people know that they're approaching death, it brings out the best in them. Most, peop most people are extraordinary in the face of their own deaths. 
not everybody. You know, if you were a cantankerous old bee before, you're going to be a cantankerous old bee while you're dying. And that's fine. People do it as they are. But it does bring out the best in people very, very often. And it's an absolute privilege to be part of that. Um, I've, my daughter's just moved home again, um, is on the first steps of a career. And um, I was talking the other day about um, how we never actually know what we're going to be when we grow up. <laughs> and it, she thinks it should be really clear and it should all be there. And, and she asked me how, how I ended up doing what I did. And, and, and I did know this question would come up tonight. And I don't quite know how that pathway came. I was a bit nursey, a little bit gobby. Um, grew up in a cottage called Hatch and Dispatch Cottage because my, my mum was the midwife and my dad was the taxi driver and then they put the back seat down and put the coffin on it and so he drove the hearse. <laughs> so um, I was used to coffins on the dining room table and so what that does give you is um, what I realise now at my grand age is the real privilege of <laughs> most of the time feeling comfortable around the dead which I realise is, a, is an absolute privilege and it's nothing wonderful about you at all, it's like being able to make dresses it's the thing you can do and when I was nursing um, it, it, you used the word privilege and it can sound a bit it, you know, it's a hard word to use but I can remember being taught to lay somebody out by a, a fantastic nurse tutor telling us it was the last thing we could do and that you do it well and and seeing it in that context always stayed with me I never forgot it that this was the last thing you can tenderly do in the physical care um, unfortunately the first time I did it I put somebody's top set of their dentures in the bottom and the other way round and didn't quite get it right and some poor mortuary technician would have had to rectify that later but but I did it with a very good heart so so I think probably that wonder that that um that being around people who are very grateful for what you're doing, being there for people who can no longer care for themselves, stuck with me. And then if you fast track on to about 15 years ago, I happened to buy a cottage at the end of a cul-de-sac next to a chapel of rest with the funeral directors at the end. And he used to walk past with his coffins to the coffin store. Um, as I was gardening or cutting the hedge, and we'd have conversations about death and dying and funerals. And very simply, one day, he knocked on my door and said, what are you doing on Friday? And I said, oh, it's also a hardware shop, this funeral directors. It's like going back in time. And, and I said, oh, do you want me to look after the shop? I'm not doing anything on Friday. And he said, no, you're doing a funeral for me. And, and we, went, we went from there, um, and I learned running, really. Um, but it, it, it's, there's a, a comfortable place in me that, which could be the same as if you put a bolt of fabric in front of somebody and they could make a beautiful dress out of it. And I'm just grateful for that sense of peace in that industry. That's lovely. Thank you. That's always really interesting to find how people um, end up in places they are. So who's next? Um, because of this room. Um, hello. Uh, this is one more. Oh. Um, well, oh, wow. I find it a bit um, uh, ironic that with the growth of medical sciences, we also saw the growth of the funeral industry. Um, and uh, I and um, it's um, and well, in your line of work, have you seen circumstances where? where a death can burden um, a family financially and emotionally, and how soon should we take steps to ensure that this does not happen, um, given our fear of death? Yeah, I deal with families quite regularly that have um, 
had to pay for a funeral that they couldn't afford. And it, as I said, uh, well, as I touched on earlier on, it's awful, particularly when that's a sudden death, an unexpected death, and no preparation has been made. But then it's almost as bad when it's somebody who's very elderly has just died, and the, the family ring me and say, oh, you know, he was 89, but we haven't got any money to pay for his funeral. You, think, you, you knew that this might be a possibility in the next few years, you know, it might have been worth thinking about it. Um, but you're right, the, the funeral industry has mushroomed in the last few years. The people often think that the more they spend on the funeral, the m- the more it appears that they loved that, that person. And that's a really difficult thing to, to try and combat, really, and to try and explain to people that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many flowers you have there. It doesn't matter how many cars are on the funeral. It doesn't matter what people who are watching the funeral think. And I don't know anybody who looks at a funeral and thinks they haven't spent enough money on that. I've never come across anybody who's ever said that to me, yet people arranging the funeral think that that's what other people think. And, you know, we, we show what we think of people when they're alive, as far as I'm concerned. You don't wait until the funeral and splash loads of money on it, as the Victorians did. Um, but, yeah, it, it, funeral poverty is becoming a massive problem in this country, and funeral directors uh, work in an unregulated industry, so there isn't anybody putting the brakes on them or highlighting their selling methods. And I'm not saying that all funeral directors... Um, so let people spend more money than they should, but there is certainly a decent number that do. Um, my, pers- my own personal perspective is I think it is one of the very few purchases where people don't see themselves as a consumer. There is nothing else that I can think of that people will spend four or five thousand pounds and not compare prices from one supplier to another. And as long as you're only going to, if you compare that to buying a television, if you're only going to one shop, that shop can charge you whatever it wants to charge you because you don't know whether that's expensive or not. And people do, they find it distasteful to, to shop around for funerals. And as long as they feel like that, then funeral directors can charge whatever they want to charge. So the, there needs to be a shift in attitudes, really, towards money and death. And, yeah, those, as we all know, are very difficult things to, to change people's attitudes towards. But, yeah, it is, it's a big problem. Um, we, we obviously see this only on a periphery of the issue, but um, we certainly do see quite a few cases where people stay with us in our care for longer than they may have done sort of five, ten years ago because there is the struggle to pay for the funeral. Um, and I would echo quite a lot of what you've just said there. Um, um, somebody mentioned DIY funerals earlier on. I think that's certainly the way I'll be going um, when I finally die. Um, but no, absolute increase um, in this kind of problem. Um, it is a problem that's starting to be more recognized and dealt with. Um, as one of my other roles, I'm involved in the um, professional body for our um, profession. Um, and I went to a meeting yesterday where it was quite widely discussed that government do need to actually get a grip of this situation um, and as well as tackling the funeral pro- poverty um, from the aspect of prices being simply too high there's also need for reform of the um, social fund so um, if people can't afford the funeral then there, there is money available from um, Department of Work and Pensions to actually pay for the funeral but it can be quite difficult to access that money and the process can be very long, which can lead to quite dramatic delays between death and funeral. Um, So that obviously adds extra stress and and, an upset to the families. But there is actually starting to become a realization that things need to change. So hopefully um, there may be action. Um, The thing that I would say is if, if we were being fiercely practical at your tender age you could put ten pounds a month away in a building society and it would build up and you could either have a really great party when you were 60 or you could leave it there and it would pay for your funeral that would be one way of tackling it another really simple thing 
I think, and from what I see in my working practice, is for people when somebody dies to stop, take a deep breath, and not rush into anything. So short of the procedures that you deal with, if, if something like those procedures is not involved, if it is a death where the person has died and you're charged with organizing the funeral, Quite often in this country, we die on a Monday, we're buried or cremated the following Monday. There's not a funeral director in the land that can't actually look after you for two weeks before you would even have to think about embalming or anything. So it doesn't solve all your financial problems, but if you just take a minute, take some time, because people don't plan their funerals. They don't come on my workshop and plan them. So it's a bit of a shock that your mother-in-law dies and, and as a family you have a funeral to organize and you go to the, the funeral director that's around the corner and they say, oh yes, we'll book you in for next Monday. There's no reason that you have to step on that conveyor belt that day. Take a breath, stop, think, what do we want? What can we do ourselves if finances are an issue? Who's got a beautiful garden and would really love to make the bunch of flowers that goes on the coffin? Who's really good with the printer and desktop publishing and can do the order of service? Those things. Just don't rush to decisions. And that way, you don't find yourself signing bits of paper and not shopping around. But Because I, I would also take... Um, I would, I would also think it's actually a very difficult thing when all that emotional turmoil is going on in that first 24 hours after you've just lost somebody you love or care for deeply. It's really hard then to get the witch magazine out of local funeral directors or go on the website that compares them or you know, find the opera singing guy that's doing compare.com and that's actually quite an emotional journey to find yourself on to have that sensible head to make sensible decisions. It's a big ask, so, so don't ask it of yourself for a couple of days. You can find a funeral doctor that you feel comfortable with and say to them, I'll come and see you in a couple of days. They can pick the person up, they can care for them, or you can keep them at home, but don't rush to decisions, and that way you won't spend money you haven't got, you won't make decisions that you didn't want to make, and you might actually find yourself coming to a creative place for this person that's died. So I'll just come back a second, <laughs> picking up on what you said, in that that is advice that we often give to people, is get the neighbor to shop around. You don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to do everything yourself. When somebody dies, people will always get people saying to them, what can I do? Is there anything I can do to help? And usually you're saying, no, there isn't anything. Say to them, shop around a few funeral directors for me, get some prices. Any chance you could do some flowers for me? Yeah, the um, orders of service. There are lots of elements of the funeral that you can do yourself. And people get uh, so much out of doing that, it's, it's that good. they're involved and they haven't just handed the whole thing over to a stranger. And the, the interesting thing is, my mum died a couple of years ago, and when she was alive, she said to me, you will do my funeral, won't you? And I, you could, how could I say no to this cute little old lady that I knew was going to die soon? Um, didn't think, oh my goodness, what does that actually mean? And if anybody should have known how to organise a funeral, it, it was me, and I'd spent six days on a palliative care journey, not leaving a room, and she died at four in the morning, and I eventually got home to my sitting room at half past eight listening to these birds singing. And I've got some skills in planning a funeral. And my brain went to mush. My mum wanted to die. My, my mum had the most amazing death you could imagine. She was worn out with dementia. There was no reason that I should have not been pleased for her. And my daughter had to text me each day in the morning. She'd send me a text and say, Mum, it's Tuesday. And I'd text back and say, thank you, because I couldn't work out what the day of the week was. And I didn't quite know how to, to organize the funeral. 
and I messed up the probate, which is in incredibly embarrassing when your working life is in the funeral industry. And what it taught me is we can plan, we can fill out forms, we can make our decisions, but actually what we can't plan for is the loss of the people we love and the effect it has on us that day when they take their last breath. So we need to be kind to ourselves. You know, by the next day when I had worked out, it was Tuesday, and um, uh, you know, I was back to speed, then things started to happen. Thank you, some great advice there. Everybody take heed. Um, this gentleman, great green jumper. Hi. Um, I'm interested in what you said about palliative care and particularly the importance of having a conversation with, say, people who are terminally ill to find out what they want and how they see the last leg of their journey, if you like. So my question, hopefully brief, is that uh, when you're teaching, when you're talking to other people, who are the other people who might be involved in this conversation and what's your key, your key advice to them, key messages? Sorry, I need to be clear, I've got the question. So when I'm teaching, who, who are the other people? Okay. Okay, so um, I think the most important thing is that we keep the person that this is happening to at the center. Um, when people are ill and know that they're approaching death, it's, it's very akin to um, what we were just saying about, you know, after somebody's died, everybody wants to do something. And so what people around that person often do is try to take burden away from them. Um, and so they, they want to help and often they will, can disempower the person themselves. So the, the most important thing is that the conversation, as long as the person is competent, the conversation has to be with that person. And yes, we need to involve the people that they want us to involve. Um, and that might be just a spouse, it might be just a daughter, it might be the whole family, um, but it's actually the person that we're talking to who will tell us who those other people are and how they want them to be involved. Does that answer your question? It's very easy in a healthcare situation, and I still see it. Um, my consultant colleagues will, I, I'll see a beautifully documented conversation with Mrs. Brown's daughter. And I will say, Mrs. Brown is able to have this conversation herself. Why hasn't this conversation been had with Mrs. Brown? Well, she'd just come out of theater and she was still a bit sleepy. Yes, so this conversation needed to wait until Mrs. Brown was the person having it. We're st we can, you still come across, I'm afraid, some, we should call it parentalism rather than paternalism, because it's men and women. Um, parentalism, where we think, we think we're doing the right thing. But I, the way I teach the medical students is I say, just think, if it was you that this was happening to, who would you want us to talk to? Would you want us to talk to you, or would you want us to talk to your mum, or your partner, or your daughter, if you've got one? And they all say, no, you need to talk to me. Well, take that message and translate it into your practice. Talk to the person that this is happening to. If they say, I don't want to talk about this, talk to my daughter, that's fine. But sometimes that um, asking the question who we should talk to gets missed. Okay, um, I think this gentleman, do you have a question? Um, yeah, uh, so far it's all been basically around uh, Western ideas of burial and what your thoughts are about 
other types like sky burials, etc. Have they ever, ever been brought up with you at all? Not sky burials, no. Um, we don't have the facilities. I mean, we look after all sections of the community. So we have Cardiff is it was a, a port of one of the busiest ports in the world for many years. We, it's got a very diverse community, so we look after people of all faiths, cultures, backgrounds. And, but to be honest, it doesn't really matter to us what religion or culture somebody comes from. It just matters what they need. And it's just, if that falls in line with a general religious practice, then and that's what informs them, then that's fine. But we just want funerals to be what the family needs in order for them to say goodbye to that person in the most appropriate way. So, yeah, uh, what happens in Cardiff will be part of Western culture, but it will be informed by any number of cultures from around the world and no culture whatsoever and just things that people have decided would be the right thing for them. And again, this is part of the problem with um, arrangements being handed over to funeral directors and that it's good for funeral directors if everybody does the same thing because it makes their job nice and easy. So we try and help people to question and to um, challenge a little bit more and to say, no, th this is what we need and this is what's the most appropriate thing for us and how are you going to help us do it? Anybody, anything else? Sue? No? Did a service around a compost bin once. Um, people, that's, that's a phrase, a throwaway line that isn't very helpful to families when they're talking to people about planning funerals. So you, very often you'll hear folks say, oh, just put me on the compost bin. And it doesn't tell anybody anything, except for this gentleman was really clear he wanted to be on the compost bin. And so he had um, a direct cremation, and we held a really tender funeral rite around his beautifully made compost bin. <laughs> he was scattered and became part of the process. So absolutely, I just reflect everything that Rachel says. It's around, it's, it's a hackneyed phrase, isn't it, person-centered? because there's an awful lot of work comes with making things person-centered on both sides of that dialogue. But that, that's what it needs to be. We can't, we can't say that this is a Hindu funeral rite, because across the world, there will be legion. It, it just needs to be right at the time. OK, thank you. Um, I think there was somebody over this region. Could you tell us something about your job that surprised you? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Okay, shall I start? That's tricky, yeah. Shall I start? I've if got you've one. got an answer. Um, so, one of the most surprising things that ever happened was that we had um, a lady in the oncology centre quite a while ago who was very, very poorly, and one of our consultant oncologists, who tends to be quite straightforward, shall we say, went in, and when he came out, she was aware that she probably had a week or two to live. And um, I went in with my utterly fantastic junior doctor but he was incredibly camp had peroxide blonde hair about you know half an inch long sorry one centimeter long and uh, she just said if I've got two weeks to live do you think you could tell my husband I don't want to see him again So I said, if that's really important to you, yes, we can. I'm really sorry, but would you just mind explaining why? And she said, because he's made my life a misery, and if I've only got two weeks more of it, I don't want to see him again. At which point we said, okay. And um, 
Then we looked up the ward and the husband was walking up the ward. And my absolutely gorgeous junior doctor just looked at me and said, she needs you, I'll deal with him. And the husband's quite a big chap and he's quite slight and as I said, incredibly camp and I just thought he's gonna get battered to death. <laughs> so I said to the lady, just give me a second. And he's disappearing into the visitor's room with this enormous big guy. And I said to the, I went to the nursing station and I said, you go in there in about three minutes and you make sure he's all right. And then I went and talked to his wife. And in fact, he was absolutely fine and dealt with it beautifully and didn't get blobbed, which was good. Um, and she, interestingly, she, she said, when I'm so poorly that I'm unconscious and I don't know he, and I wouldn't know he's there, if he wants to come in, that's okay. But until that point, I don't want to see him again. So that was a bit of a surprise. Um, my surprise is, um, it's, it's, always, it's almost on a daily basis, that um, how quickly people will give you power in their family and that you have to really understand that. So I walk in, I, I always reckon I've got about two minutes to make people feel safe with me when I walk through their door because quite often when I walk through the door they've never met me before they've been told there's this, there's this nice woman, you know, by the funeral director, they believe the funeral director because again they're on that conveyor belt and um, and so I feel I have to work in, in making sure that they trust me really quickly. And I normally get a cup of tea and we sit down and we start the process of planning a funeral. They've never met me before. And the whole family politics just gets placed in front of me. And... Um, uh, you know, I always, I always say to people, you do understand everything is completely confidential. What happens in this room is, is confidential. But they've just taken it as a given. And, and it's a bit what I was talking about again, that, that, that for seven days is that it, it's other. You enter another world. And um, something you have to protect yourself in the profession is that you're, you're given all these... Um, extraordinary family stories <laughs> and I describe my job as a minefield that looks like a meadow and you just have to be really careful about the daisies you know that's that's I never know what I'm walking into um, and uh, and you have to respect everything that people are telling you in quite a matter-of-fact way you have to have the right face um, and one one very one something that sticks in my mind is the, the loveliest of families. The person that had died was quite elderly, so the children were in their 70s. And they were really loving, and they were all there, and they were all telling me these fantastic stories, just this wonderful life, really well lived, and they got lovely ideas for the funeral. And then one, there were three of one sex and one of the other. And... Um, the one of the one sex said, I'm so sorry, but I've got to go now. And they'd kind of told me they were going to have to go early. And they went, and they were barely out of the room, barely the front door had shut. And the three remaining siblings told me that they weren't the child of the family, but they didn't know in then that amount of time. And it's just being prepared for, you know, and gently saying, well, I'm not sure that impacts the funeral you know in your head trying to put that into place and that that trust so it's not abusing that trust but that always surprises me is how quickly when dying is in the conversation the trust that you are offered and 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 what you do with that um one of the biggest surprises for me when i started this job was just how many people die um <laughs> That may be a function of me being young and naive, but I was absolutely amazed. I thought perhaps a couple of people a week. 
I had no idea. Um, but, but one of my biggest surprises in the job was, this is when I worked in a hospital, and it's a hospital that shall remain nameless, um, that's in the north of Bristol. Um, <laughs> and they had some very, um, shall we say, relaxed security personnel. So we do, we do viewings and formal identification things at any time of the day or night, generally speaking, with a few limitations. Um, so I was on call one night and I received a phone call from security. They said, there's a family here who'd like to come and see um, their relative. Um, they're quite large um, family and they're quite insistent. Um, I said, okay, that's fine. So off I went to the hospital. And I thought I'd pop into the security lodge on the way in just to see what was happening. And I found them in a state of what can only be described of sheer panic. Um, because this large family were around about 100 to 120 people strong. Um, them being insistent was they'd essentially occupied a corridor of the hospital, were refusing to leave until somebody showed them the, the body of their loved one, and they were going to take the body home with them. And if anyone tried to stop them, they were going to stab them. Um, so... I said to the security staff, so what are you going to do about it? And they said, well, nothing, it's down to you. <laughs> and this was as they were putting on their stab-proof vests. Um, and I said, well, okay, I can try, but have you got one of those for me? And he said, no, we've only got two. Um, <laughs> so off I went, um, probably against all advice on health and safety you can possibly think of. Um, the mortuary, of course, was in a very small corner of the hospital. Usually, if you're trying to find a mortuary in a hospital, it's by the chimney. Um, there's an unfortunate association that, that has been made by s architects down through the years. We're hopefully getting away from that now. Um, when the, when the new, big new hospital that shall remain nameless in, in North Bristol was being built recently, I was lucky enough to be involved in the planning of that of the uh, mortuary facility and first of all they had planned it as being obviously they needed some kind of loading area which we need for funeral directors and things they decided that that's okay you can use the same loading area that is used for the clinical waste so I did point out to them that might not send the strongest message that essentially you're treating people's loved ones as rubbish so in the end, they ended up putting in a brand new, completely separate corridor for, for that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> so it was a very sort of dingy co corner of the hospital complex, very poorly lit. So I went sort of tiptoeing down there to see what was going on. Um, and literally, I think one of the members of the nursing staff had said, um, yeah, the mortuary are going to deal with you, so off you go down there. There's the directions. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Um, breathe a sigh of relief. So they all turned to turn up at a mortuary. Um, in the meantime, I'd got the person ready for viewing because we prepare people to look as good as they possibly can for viewing. Um, I had done that. I'd laid them out. Um, I'd also put all of the keys in the other side of the door, in all of the doors leading away from the viewing room. So if I had to, I could run um, and lock the doors behind me very quickly. Um, uh, so then the family turned up there were lots of them. Lots of them were quite aggressive and quite angry. Um, it had been a rather sudden death, and they were finding it extremely difficult to deal with. It didn't help the fact that the vast majority of them were drunk, um, which you know is, is more common than you might expect. It's a kind of coping mechanism. Um, but luckily for me, um, there was somebody there who was kind of acting as a spokesperson for the um, for, for the, the family, and I managed to have quite a long conversation with them and actually calm the situation down. Um, quite a boring end to the story, you know. You know it would be, it'd be, it'd be much better if I'd been attacked and dragged through the streets, but but it just it just proved to me that it just took. And this is, this is no kind of um, criticism, well, maybe a slight criticism of the hospital staff in that I don't think anyone really attempted to do that. It was just a case of, oh, my God, we've got this mass of people. And I saw the CCTV from the security lodge, and it was just a corridor full of people. Um, 
and I think they all kind of just kind of batten down the hatches. Um, but in my experience, there's usually one person. You hope that there's one person who's a bit more reasonable and willing to talk. And if you take the time to actually sit them down, perhaps get them away from the rest of the people, um, then generally speaking, you can come to an arrangement. And, you know, if it actually came to it, was I going to stop 100 drunken people taking a body away from the mortuary? No. Um, but I would have called the police as soon as they left and let them deal with it. But you can usually find a way through these situations, in my experience. Yeah. Um, I think rather than an instant, I'm just going to say that the surprise for me is what a happy job it is. And people often say to me, oh, I must be really sad where you work. And it's like, well, there's lots of funerals going on, and people are very sad. But everybody we deal with is having a horrible time, and we get the opportunity to make it a little bit less horrible. Um, and it's quite a rewarding thing to do, not in a, you know, I don't want to get too touchy-feely about it, but it's, it, it does mean that the people are quite content in their jobs and enjoy what they do. So it's, as I say, cemetery and crematorium is quite a happy place to work. Um. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Um, in term, I, I understand that um, like pacemakers are removed from bodies before they're cremated. What about other prostheses as well as um, uh, you know, precious metals like gold teeth and so on? Are they also removed prior to the body being cremated? No, they're not. The problem with pacemakers is the batteries. And obviously if they're heated, the batteries explode. So they can cause damage to the cremators. So that's the reason that um, pacemakers are removed. So really anything, and there are a few other implants that are put into bodies now that have batteries in them, or a couple of um, them have pressurized gas containers and they cause the same problem. So anything like that that's gonna cause a problem when it's heated needs to be removed. But any other metal um, will, will usually have gone during the cremation process anyway. Gold has got quite a low melting point, so you can't see it at the end of the cremation process. It's just within the remains. Um, and all sorts of titanium implants that have been put into people during their lives, hip joints, knees, some things I look at and I think, what on earth was that doing? Um, I can't identify them, but they're left over at the end of the cremation. And part of our application form is that the family signed to say that whatever metal is left at the end um, can be recycled. So what happened was if, quite a few years ago now, um, an orthopaedic surgeon in Holland sort of was thinking, I put all of these implants into people, what happens to them afterwards? And he set up a scheme where he collects from lots of crematoria in this country and in Europe as well, and collects all this metal that we're left with, which used to be buried, which has got its own environmental problems, and it is sensitively recycled. The money that he gets from the recycling pays his staff, but there's a lot of money left over, which is then split between those crematoria, and we get to give it to a, a, lo to a death-related charity of our choice. So we always try and choose a local charity. We, we've got Cruz as our charity this year, the local Cardiff and uh, Vale of Morgan Cruz, who've had lots of problems with their um, counselling funding so it's a big help to them because it can be between five and ten thousand pounds which can make a huge difference to a small charity so yeah so that's what happens with the metal thank you you're welcome if you had your hand up before hello hi um sounds like you're really good at looking after people around death and i was wondering how it's impacted on your own ideas of what you'd like from your death or um, what you see as a good death or you know and by extension what a, a good life is therefore I'm not going to die so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, okay um, uh, I think well, two things. First of all, a lot of healthcare professionals are very, very good at being very, very professional, so that what they do is look after other people and don't ever think about themselves in that situation. Um, 
And I think if you thought about yourself in that situation all the time, you probably couldn't do your job. I often say when I'm teaching, it is not as if the people that I'm seeing are my mother, my father, my husband, my children, because I couldn't do my job. So you have to have some sort of professional distance. But when you're looking after lots of people who are approaching the end of life, you, of course, um, see situations where you think, I hope nobody I love or I am ever in that situation. Um, and others where you think, you know, that would be okay. So, um, you know, I have personal experience of both of my in-laws having died, and they died after, you know, long lives well lived, um, with people around them that cared for them when they died in their own homes. Um, and that was perfect for them. But I, I think we also have to recognize that um, we can't have this idealized, romanticized idea of what the good death looks like. Um, I think if you if you look at you know films, there's, there's a lot of deaths are quite stereotypical in the way that they are portrayed. They are either violent and you know in a shoot 'em up movie, or they are um, somebody lying in their deathbed, you know, comfortable but conscious, able to talk with their loved ones around them, and a lot of people can't achieve that so um, I think there's a, there has to be a bit of pragmatism about making the best of the situation that the person is in um, and really making the best of the situation that the person is in is keeping that person as the center of your focus but also helping that person to be them and till the point that they can't anymore. Does that make sense? Allow, helping them to, to um, be themselves until they're no longer able to. And, and they will tell you, if you ask them, what's important to them. And for some people it is about, you know, staying in their own home, but for some people it's about um, being able to express their wishes. For others it's just about having those that they love around them. Um, so I, I'd be very wary of, of having an idealized picture in our own heads because our, we have no idea what circumstances we or our loved ones will be in um, as they approach the end of their lives. People ask me ever so often, have I planned my funeral? And it's that sort of plumber's leak thing, isn't it? I have, I have a notebook um, that every now and again my husband asks me where it is and I show him. Every, I have to be careful because he's in the audience. But I do know he'll forget where the notebook is. So as the older I get, I think, you know, you can get the post-its in bright orange in the shape of an arrow. So I think that will that'll be the next thing is the, the, the arrow-shaped post-it on the shelf. And um, in it are some suggestions. The only thing I'm dogmatic about in the notebook, I don't know, have you ever gone and looked at it? You can't remember where it is, can you, darling? No. Okay, well, it, um, <laughs> in it are suggestions, and the first page in it says, um, I know that you love me, and I know you'll try your best for me. If you manage most of it, that's great. If you manage not, one thing of it, that's great. Just look after me. And, but then, of course, of course, I go on for pages <laughs> of what, I've, what I like. But the one thing I am, the one th I'm going to, sorry, excuse me while I ignore you all a minute. The one thing I'm really dogmatic about, okay, is the photograph. I've chosen the photograph for the order of service because it's, um, it's when I was younger than I am now. It was the one time that I was a size 12 in the whole of my adult life. Um, I think it's what I look like now. <laughs> and that is, that is the photograph that's going to be on the order of service. And if you don't, I'll come back and watch you. 
<laughs> so there, there are, you know, I've done those things, but the thing that comes out of that, we've had cause to have discussions in our family about funerals quite seriously. And um, uh, we, we were talking, we've also witnessed um, making massive decisions for somebody we loved very much who had dementia. And the thing that I think we've passed to each other now is that we are privileged that we love each other and we trust each other. And that um, out of that love and trust, if I no longer have capacity or I am exhausted by my disease, I trust them, you know. Um, but I would put it, <laughs> I would put it into context. My poor husband's heard this story so many times, but um, we talk about death in our house, much to the frustration of our children who do this a lot. <laughs> and um, one day um, we were listening to Shine On Your Crazy Diamond and I said to my husband, <laughs> I'd always seen you coming into this. And he looked at me and said, why? And I said, because it's your favorite Pink Floyd track. And he said, no, it's the one you let me listen to. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. He then played me his favorite Pink Floyd track. And went, no, you're not having that. We're not coming into that. <laughs> so sometimes the truth we think we know, we don't know. And, um, and you're coming in to shine on your crazy diamond. So, but, but, so there's that trust and that love, but, but you need to say it. You know, if there are things that are really important to you, have the notebook somewhere. People are not telepathic, but by the same token, don't set them up. So, you know, just keep that dialogue going. Don't have the big death conversation. It, there's never a good moment for it, and it doesn't. It, I'm talking about out of the context of palliative care. So, you know, you're all going to go away from here thinking about death and dying. You're all going, your, your funerals are going to be quite present with you for a while, or how you may die, or where you may go. It's going to sit with you for quite some time. It might be a moment to sow a few seeds. The family won't thank you if you bring it up at the next fam birthday gathering or the next wedding. While I've got you all sat here at this wedding, could we just talk about Pink Floyd? That, that isn't, they're not going to hear. But sow seeds. Be, be generous with what you ask people and, and don't, don't set them up. Probably one of the biggest things that it's done to me is um, obviously we're probably more likely to think about our own death and, and perhaps start planning some certain things. Um, really what it's done to me is make me somewhat preoccupied about if I die in, 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 in an unnatural way when I'm convinced I'm going to die in some kind of real comedy way um, <laughs> perhaps by a falling grand piano or something um, I'm just kind of wondering who would do my autopsy um, because being involved in our national association I know an awful lot of technicians um, and I would want someone I can trust but by extension somebody I trust would be somebody that I'm friends with and uh, I hope they wouldn't relish the prospect of conducting my autopsy but um, but also, on a serious note, I, I've thought about it a lot because people always ask the question, what do you do if you get somebody that you know in to the mortuary? Um, and the answer is always, well, we make a judgment on how we feel at the time. Um, there's absolutely no pressure either way put on anybody by the organization or, or by the management. Um, most people, we simply give them the day off. Um, their loved one is dealt with. They have confidence that their loved one's going to be dealt with well and they're going to be looked after, and then they come back to work when it's all been finished with. But I've also known people who've been actively involved in the care of their loved one, and they've, in, the, in much the way in the last office's procedure, they've seen it as the last thing they can do. Um, they have confidence in their work. They know that their work is, is of a high quality, and they, they see it as a real privilege. Um, so, yeah, it's a kind of a question that I've kind of been wrangling with, um, Hopefully, they won't come to that, but uh, it's one I've yet to answer, so we'll see. <laughs> I know for my funeral, I want to make sure that people are sad. I see a lot of people <laughs> trying to not be sad for funerals and trying to kind of escape the grieving process or think that there's, as long as they do everything right, then that's not going to happen. But however well you prepare for a funeral, however whether it's your own or somebody else's, however well it's planned, it always seems to take people by surprise quite how upset they are. 
and I want everybody in black, hats preferably. <laughs> I want sad music. Get it all out of your system, have a good old cry. I'm not there, why wouldn't you cry? It's awful. So just <laughs> accept that this is a bad thing that's happened and let yourself go through all those emotions. But yeah, a little bit of drama, no harm in that. <laughs> Dry ice in the grave. Okay, just, <laughs> I'm putting it out there. I, my friends know, they know in work, my family know, that's, that's what's required. If it's, th if it's thunder and lightning at the time as well, that won't do any harm. Um, but yeah, let's, let's make sure it's sad. <laughs> Thank you. Right, we are gonna have to have one last question. Um, so that's a gentleman up here. How does suddenness or the unexpected nature of a death affect your work and including with how you deal with mourners, those who are left behind? It's, um, it, it doesn't affect our work in a purely technical sense. Um, it means that someone's much more likely to be referred to us. Um, and it means that you often have much less to go on when you're trying to determine why somebody's died. If somebody's had a long illness, if somebody has long-standing medical issues, then obviously you have a basis to start from um, looking for a cause of death. If someone's been completely healthy or seemingly completely healthy and then just collapsed and died on the street, then that makes it more difficult. But in, in terms of the process... The process is the same regardless of whether it's an expected or a, a sudden death. Um, the real differences come when you, you start to meet the um, loved ones of that deceased. Um, and try to help them understand what the, what, what's going to happen now. Because it's an awfully bureaucratic process, death. Um, there's so much going on. There's so many decisions to make. There's so many convoluted legal processes to go through paperwork and processes it's just it's almost like somebody has designed a process which is which is as difficult as it can be for someone who's in emotional turmoil um, so from our from our perspective we, we try to explain the process in as clear a way as possible um, sometimes we, we come into problems with by the time people reach us they've already gone through several um, agencies or organizations so such as um, healthcare or um, police if it's a sudden death um, and sometimes the approach that's been taken before they get to us is um, exactly how I was described before a kind of um, parentalist attitude where we know what's best for you we're, we're kind of keeping that information from you for your own good um, no, you can't come and see your relative because they've died in an accident and there are some injuries and things like that. So this person is not viewable. That's, that's a phrase that we hear very often. I've told the family that their loved one's not viewable. Um, we can't do that. Uh, it's not our decision to make. It's none of our business. All we can do is advise people what the situation is, advise them that... There are certain circumstances around the death that may upset them, um, be clear and honest with them, um, but we can't stop people seeing their loved one. Um, I always try and, we, we always try and relate everything back to our own experience, so how do we feel if this was us? Um, and I always say to my staff, you know, if, heaven forbid, one of my children should die, then you can try and stop me seeing them, um, but you won't be very successful. And there, there is generally an attitude out there that people can be stopped and that people can have decisions made for them. Um, they can be selectively given information based on what the person thinks they should know. Um, so that can make it quite difficult for us to then explain the process that we're going to undertake because it can be completely um, out of the blue and not mentioned before they've actually reached us. Um, but again, it's trying to explain it in a way that in their, in their state of sudden grief they can understand and they can hopefully take that information away with them um, and actually have some comfort in the fact that they know what's going to happen next and they know 
Um, I think it's quite important for them to meet the people who are going to be doing examinations. I always um, make a point of saying that to families that I meet, that you know it will be me or one of my colleagues that is going to be present throughout the entire examination. Um, and I can promise you that we will look after them. Um, because there's no getting away from the fact performing an autopsy on someone is, is about the most invasive thing you can ever do to them. Um, there's no getting away from that at all. Um, things may change in the future. There's lots of work being done around less invasive autopsy with scanning and things like that, so it may well change. But at the moment, traditional autopsy is very, very invasive, which is why it's extremely important for us to do it in as sensitive and dignified way as we possibly can. And families always very much appreciate almost putting a human being into the process and seeing, well, I've met you now, I know that you or one of your staff is going to be present. And we're in quite a lucky position because we can promise that we will look after that person and we can promise that no harm will come to them while they're with us. Um, and this is what gonna, what's going to happen next. This is who you can contact for more information. And just providing that information in a clear, concise way tends to cut through some of the complete shock and distress that happens when there's a sudden and unexpected death. Um, but yeah, it can be difficult at times because people just, they don't listen to what you say a lot of the time because they're just not in a, in a, in a, state, in a state to be able to do that. Um, a perfect example is um, when people come for a viewing, we used to say to them when they arrived, have you come to see Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so? And the person obviously says yes. Um, we had a situation where we said that to somebody once, and they said yes, and they hadn't at all. They'd come to see somebody completely different, and there was a real risk that we could have shown somebody the wrong person. We've since changed our procedures, so we say to people now, who have you come to see? And you know, actually get people to say the name themselves. But it just shows how little sometimes the information goes in. Um, so you have to really, really strike that balance between being compassionate and being gentle with the way you explain things, but actually giving them proper facts and being sometimes quite, quite firm with, with how you're discussing things so that they're getting the information they need. Anybody else want to any add to that? Or? Only that um, I think actually all death is sudden. It sounds a strange thing to say, but I'll, I'll sometimes work with somebody that is dying, so I've then worked with the family, and then they'll phone me and the person has died, and we enact the things that we've all discussed beforehand, and still they're shocked. There's still a sense of shock um, after life being followed by death. But as far as I'm concerned, when um, it's a very sudden, unexpected death, never is it more important than that thing I was talking about earlier, which is taking time. Because there, there's a stillness normally in those homes where there's not an iota of understanding of what is going on. And that's absolutely the, the time when decisions get made that they regret later. So for, for my practice, um, it's, it's going and making contact with people and being really clear with them that we don't have to make any decisions about the funeral for, we don't have to rush into it. Because the, 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 there is a stillness that I haven't got a word to describe in those homes of complete and utter disbelief no sense not being able to understand it. And it could be very abusive then saying, you know, let's sit down and plan a funeral now. That's, that's the last thing that they can really process. Okay, great. Um, we did have a little thing planned for speakers to chat, but you've all been so um, involved and wanted to ask questions that we haven't got around to that. So I'll just give the speakers one last chance to say anything they want to say. No, nope. brilliant. Great. So it just leaves us to um, say thank you very much to the speakers and for being a great audience.
sorry, there was just one last thing I wanted to say. Um, obviously, you know about the exhibition, but, and we have further events associated with it coming up. And we've got a death fair on the 5th of March, where a lot of these issues will be explored in more de uh, detail and depth, more information can be given. Um, we've also got another couple of talks coming up, so look at our website to, to find out more about those. But thank you very much for coming tonight, and uh, have a good weekend.